All right, well, hello, I'm Steve Knepp. I run the global telecommunications media and entertainment industry for IBM and have for uh, a very long time. I thought I'd do three things today. Share a little bit about what's happening in IBM because we're transforming really quickly. Two, talk about what I see happening in the marketplace, and I've, I've netted it down to five key observations that I think are key for everyone to understand and how we're working with clients all over the globe uh, to solve business problems for them. And then three, a little bit about what we're actually going to show at NAB. So if you're there, you can take a look at it. So first, what do we mean when we say media and entertainment? Basically, we try to aggregate a whole bunch of sub-segments into things that are logical. So those in the, in the business of producing content, those in the business of distributing content, information po uh, providers and publishers, and then uh, all the ad tech, marketing communications, and all the new firms, search social, so Google, Facebook, Baidu, Tencent. These are all our clients around the world. There's two advantages to our model. One is we see things happening in different places uh, around the world in different markets. Not everywhere is transforming at the same rate and pace. And two, different things are happening in different segments, which we can borrow to help cl clients in those segments transform. As far as IBM goes, um, it's a very different company than it was just a few years ago. Over the last 10 years or so, we spent $20 billion bringing all kinds of technology, mostly in the cloud and cognitive or analytic space, and most recently in the video space into our company. And that augments about $6 billion a year we spend in core R&D within the company. So for, I think it was the 20th straight year or thereabouts, we just led uh, the world in patents again this last year. The thing that I'll highlight today is that 90% of our revenue now is about software and services. So we really think of ourselves as a cognitive solution company that's delivered through cloud platforms and basically through the context of industries like media and entertainment. And then the acquisitions that we've done most recently, so Aspera, who's one of the sponsors here, but also Clearleap, uh, Ustream, and, and what we did with Cleversafe, which is an object storage architecture that underlies what we're doing. So, some observations on what we see happening uh, in the industry. First, to me, the rate and pace of change is only going to accelerate. We know what happened when the web came along. All, the, all these folks came online uh, all over the globe. As we look forward over the next few years, that's only going to accelerate, right? We're going to see more and more people every corner of the globe, another 2 billion people coming online, most of that in the context of mobile. So if we look at each of the segments of the industry and what's happened over the last few years, there's been a migration because with all these new services, all these new channels, all this new content, the one thing that hasn't changed is the amount of time we all have. So think of yourself and where you invest your time every day, what services you use. And if those services aren't personalized exactly to what you want, you're not going to choose them. So to me, the nature of competition in the industry has fundamentally changed. Basically, we used to think studios competed with studios and television shows competed with television shows, mobile companies, mobile companies, you know, uh, gaming with gaming platforms. The reality is everyone is competing with everyone else for that moment in time where you have time to consume something. So the question is, are they providing the right value proposition to you at that moment in time? And, and as we led up to IBC this last year, we surveyed a few thousand consumers across Europe, and basically one in three said they were satisfied with what exists in the marketplace today. That's another reason why we think incredible change is still in front of us, faster than it's been over the last few years. The thing that I learned a very long time ago is if you're trying to implement a new disruptive uh, model in this industry, if you look at price, quality, and convenience, you have to deliver at least two of those three in order to have a chance for your service to catch on and survive, which means the bar for competition is getting incredibly higher. So for companies in this industry, you have to design change into your core business model, into your core solution architecture, and that's why we've been committed for the last decade on building open standards-based architectures that can allow you to launch services much quicker to market. So then what's, what's driving the transformation within the industry? Basically, I think it's these four things. It's cloud, it's analytics, it's mobile, and it's social. We all know everyone surfs the web, uses social media while they're watching television. Some five million years of video is going to cross the internet every month very quickly. So think about the scale that that represents. And what's important about that is the number of transactions that that represents. Think about what happened in the banking industry if you go back to the late 90s. And when they went to ATMs, network banking, self-service, what came out of that? Ideas like lifetime value of a customer, profitability of a customer, upsell value, family value. Analytics-based notions that help banks target you as a customer and create value off of what you wanted. I would argue the same exact thing is happening now in the media and entertainment industry. And if you think about 
what CMOs are facing to create profitability in their business, to sustain margins in this business of, of hyper competition, they're telling us through a survey we did around the globe of CMOs that social uh, media and customer analytics are absolutely vital to going forward. So we're seeing these technologies and these capabilities move into the CMO's office. In fact, CMOs will spend more money on technology and technology services three years from now than the IT department will. That's how big this shift is. And then when we talk to CEOs around the globe, 70% of them say we've got to get value out of all this data, and we've got to be able to shorten our cycle time to get products and services to market quickly. So what do these forces do? Well, cloud, you heard it in the last presentation. I'm sure you've heard it in every presentation. Our strategy is very clear. We started with an enterprise class cloud that has the security architecture, bare metal provisioning, broadband, uh, huge data center uh, capabilities, uh, uh, huge fiber between the data centers, so that you essentially can enter content or services into the cloud and have it come out anywhere in the world where it has to come out. That's really key. And having, in cl having a cloud platform that was de designed from the start for enterprise is different than having one that was designed for consumer solutions and has grown into the enterprise. And you'll see that in the way that we're architecting some of our capability. Watson, I'll show you a little bit about this later, but the idea that you have to get smart. Cognitive computing is about having compute platforms that get smarter over time, that learn over time, and that allow you to, get, to implement solutions that are agile at the moment of consumption. And I'll show you how we're doing that. For me, mobile is all about connection, back to that finance example. It's about the bi-directional flow of information that's now happening and all the data that that represents that comes from those transactions. We're here at Google today. It's no secret that they do A-B testing on a regular basis. They're constantly iterating their models, looking at sub-segments of their audience group. I would argue every media company to compete in this new world has to be able to do that. And then finally, this notion of media that it was vertical channels to market, radio, television, along comes the web, right? So these fixed function stacked architectures were built. And the reality is, in order to be agile in this marketplace, you have, you have to be horizontal from, from an enterprise architecture standpoint. Because there's this flow of data. Consumers don't consume in isolation. They're connected at the edge. And if you're not tapping into that flow of data, you're missing an in incredible uh, amount of information about what they like, what they don't like, who influences each other. And so our ability to partnerships with firms like Twitter to read all of the Twitter feed in real time and integrate that into workflows inside media companies' businesses, I, th I think is a key differentiator to going forward. So let me talk a minute about video. Video is going to be 80% of the world's data very shortly. And it's not just changing the media and entertainment industry, it's going to change every single industry. You know, today you're uh, twice as likely to buy if you're in a retail transaction and you see a video. Uh, one third of students already take an online video class. Every cop is going to have a camera on their lapel. Every building is going to have a camera on the side of it. Every car is going to have a camera in it. So video is fundamentally going to change the application architecture of every industry. The use cases in this industry are very complex. So as we're solving these, we're also thinking about B2B and B2E, business to employee applications of video technology. And that's what's driving our strategy. So we've made a number of major acquisitions that we're integrating into our cloud and cognitive capabilities so that we can accelerate the transformation of not just this industry, but every industry. So let me tell you how that comes together. And I think about it as cloud plus cognitive, plus video integrated seamlessly into a real-time platform that can personalize an experience for every consumer. So we do the masters over the top. You want to watch it lean back, you can watch it on CBS. You want to watch it in an interactive manner, we do all of the mobile, all of, you know, the tablet, the phone, uh, PC, etc. We do all the design work. And, and one of the other little known secrets is IBM runs the largest consulting design advertising agency in the world um, inside our covers. In fact, we've made three acquisitions just within the last three weeks to, to add to that interactive experience capability we have. What I think is really powerful is when you're doing, so if you watch the Masters coming up in April and you go to masters.org, you'll see our platform at work. And if you're a consumer on that platform and you, your favorite golfer made a birdie on the last hole and you missed it, you can click on that hole and see the video on demand when you want to. If you want to watch Amen's Corner all day long, you decide. You're the director. You watch that camera angle. If you want an analytics-driven experience, you dive into the data and the analytics as deeply as you want. So how, how's my favorite golfer playing? Or how did he play that last hole last time he played this hole? Or how many times has he played the match? Whatever you want to dive into, you dive into. If you're more socially driven and you want to tweet, you want to exchange in blogs, you want to be part of the narrative of the match, you can drive it that way. The point is, 
Every consumer is self-selecting the way they want to consume. We're taking an enormous amount of data, the programming, the video, the analytics, the social data, but it's a finite amount of data. Okay? It's an enormous amount, but it's a finite amount. And from that, we're creating an infinite number of experiences. That is what's important for the industry, to think about how you create framework models that allow you to take your platform and customize that platform so you hit that utility curve for each consumer in the way that they want to consume. Another example where you're seeing this incredible change is in Japan. So look at the mobile gaming market in Japan. Firms there can go in six weeks' time basically from zero to $100 million a month in revenue. You cannot do this if you have to provision technology and try to build all of these systems and platforms. So we've built, on top of our software cloud platform, all the capabilities, including the analytics, to onboard all those users, get them engaged in the game, move them up the curve, because when they move up the curve, they spend more money, they're more actively engaged, and importantly, they become an influencer that brings other people onto the platform. So what do you, how do you do that? Well, you inherently put cognitive capability and analytics into the platform so that you're analyzing that gameplay and you know exactly how they're progressing through the various levels. This kind of real-time interaction between the experience and the outcome is what differentiates services that are going to succeed in the marketplace going forward. So point three. The connected consumer era is going to require new competencies. If, if you're thinking about your business and you're thinking about how you're going to scale your business in this complex competitive world, I would argue analytics and social capabilities have to be core competencies. We're starting to see media companies around the globe get data scientists and create chief digital officers and begin to retune their organizations so that they can get more agile in this marketplace. The problem is the orientation of the business model is still around content. Now, content will always be king and it will always drive value. But the idea that you create great content and you look for channels to exploit it is kind of yesterday's idea. To me, today's idea is you think about the relationship you have with that consumer, how they touch your brand and services across the channels you offer, and how is it that you create an experience with them that builds value over time? How does your brand, your product, your service resonate with sub-segments of the audience of your customer base that have attributes associated with them that link them together with other consumers and make them interested in the kind of products and services you, uh, you offer. Why is this important? Because the expectation level of all of us, we're all prosumer users. We use platforms inside our work every single day. We use platforms as consumers every single day. And our expectations across the board are that someone who interacts with me needs to know who I am. They need to know how I want to interact with their platform or service. They want to know, you have to know what kind of offers are going to be relevant to me because I don't want to be burdened with things that are irrelevant. And finally, you want to know how to support me before I even need support. So you have to have predictive capability in your platforms that allow you to understand what's about to happen. So as an example, we're building churn analytics platforms for subscriber services that can tell based on behavioral changes exactly when that person might churn so that you can take a proactive action before that happens to try to stop that from occurring because the cost of acquisition in this marketplace continues to scale. And in fact, if we take this now and we look at the OTT market, it's exactly what we're seeing, right? 60% of, of services are going to be driven around OTT capability. That's where the investment money is shifting. But it's also shifting into customer insights and customer experience because it's a battle out there amongst all this clutter to get people associated with your brand and to activate them, not only as active users, but as influencers that bring other people to your brand. If I was building a product or service and I knew that who the thousand most influential consumers were for my product or service, I'd want to tailor my campaign and marketing activities to them because that's going to give me a return on that investment. It's much better than if I just spray information to the public at large. And I'll come back to this in a second. So how does this work? How does cloud analytics video all come together? I'll give you an example. We've, we have a, a platform called the, the Video Grid. It's basically an appliance. It can go inside a media company's platform, inside a cloud company's platform, and it allows you to create use cases like SVOD, VOD, et cetera. Or an example, though, is network DVR. So for a cable operator here in North America, about four years ago, we started deploying this platform. It scales linearly. It's the most efficient video appliance in the world. And so they started building their NDVR platform on top of this. Why is network DVR important? Well, if you take the hard drives, you put a hard drive in a home, you're signing up for at least two truck rolls. 
one to install it and one to fix it when the hard drive fails, at least two. So the cost savings alone, operationally, of moving this capability into the cloud, into the network, pays for the cloud architecture. Now we have a cloud architecture inside this cable operator that's 150 petabytes large. We move seven, eight petabytes of content every single day. Never lost a frame. And as that scales up, now we can run analytics on top of that platform. Subscriber management, churn prediction, targeted advertising. When they go to playback, given that they have the rights, if they're going to play back not just to the living room but to some other device, the minute that device connects into the network, we can figure out who they are, we can look up their subscriber profile, and we can figure out how we target a service to them that's relevant to them based on their consumption patterns, all in real time. So it's a platform that solves the core business problem about providing a service like DVR, but it puts it in the model of cloud, so now we can create incremental value for the business, whether that's upselling from a revenue standpoint and getting higher CPMs by targeting advertising, or whether that's lowering costs and operations by avoiding churn on their core subscriber base. Those are the kind of solutions I think that are beginning to change the industry, and this is why we're making huge bets on bringing video capability and marrying it with our cognitive capability, that $20 billion worth of investment we made, along with what we're doing on cloud. So if we have software, uh, and, and we have within software now recently, one of the acquisitions we did was CleverSafe. CleverSafe is an object storage platform that's used by the largest media repositories in the world. Services that you all use every single day are powered by CleverSafe because it's, it's such an efficient architecture in the way that it does parity check around the media storage. So it allows you to scale this uh, business very effe efficiently. Our soft layer cloud was designed for enterprise architectures. In fact, when SoftLayer was launched, firms like Playdom and Zynga were some of the first customers that scaled their business on top of SoftLayer. Why? The low latency network capability and the agility of being able to launch services on bare metal very fast. You may have seen just last week, we announced a strategic relationship with VMware. So now all those VMware platform applications that are in the marketplace can also move seamlessly into SoftLayer and naturally extend beyond the four walls of an enterprise business to create that platform. The challenge we had, candidly, a couple years ago is we could build any video architecture in the world. In fact, we've built most of the largest ones that are in place in the world, or at least many of them. But we didn't have an end-to-end -end video platform that was already stitched together that I could turn on tomorrow morning to help a media company launch an OTT service. So that's why we went out and we bought ClearLeap, tier one player, OVP platform enabling VOD, SVOD, OTT services, already serving firms like HBO, who's building an aggregation platform in Europe with other players, or firms like the NFL, in fact, I just came from the NFL this morning, helping create that online capability, and Ustream, which is a live streaming service that once again was built for tier one capability, can be applied now to either B to E, business to employee, communications, every company in the world needs to communicate more effectively in real time with their employees, whether it's training, education, branding, messaging, or in B to C or B or B to B solution areas. And then Aspera, we already had, you know, a fast protocol, most efficient transport protocol in the world, moves most of the media files in the world today, not only into the IBM cloud, but into every other cloud that exists. So they understand very efficiently how to orchestrate these kind of media workflows. And then finally, how do we marry the analytics with that? Well, we have this thing called Bluemix, which is a layer on top of SoftLayer. We're exposing all the IBM software as a service in that platform, all our partner software, and all the third-party open source capabilities that we're developing. And, and we have leading initiatives around all, Spark and all the other leading initiatives in, in open source. So now you have this very agile platform that your programmers, your developers can go in tomorrow morning, stitch together new services, connect those to your existing applications, and take advantage of these innovations. As an example with Watson, you could reach in, grab the Watson API, pull it out, stuff it into your application, and away you go. Or, now that we have these end-to-end -end platforms available, you can take advantage of the fact that we've already stitched together. And if you have certain preferences around transcoding services or billing services or whatever it is, we, through an open API architecture, we can connect those in. The point is, all the scalability, all of the enterprise capability, and the security, with the agility that's necessary to compete in an open architecture framework. That's been our strategy for a very long time. So fourth, so where's the, where's the battle moving? To me, the battle's moving to audience insight. 
the ability to understand your audience well. In fact, we've done analysis that says, uh, we, we've talked to CEOs around the world. Those CEOs that self-rate themselves as taking advantage of data in their business, and you look at their core performance, their revenues, their profitability, the way that they're serving their customer bases, there is a direct correlation between the firms that are embracing data and taking advantage of data and those that are performing better in the marketplace. <clears throat> so I look at the media industry, and what do I see? I see a very old model about how you segment audiences that essentially has no value today. Over under 25, male, female, doesn't tell me anything if I'm an advertiser about how I reach that customer, that consumer, with a value proposition that's relevant to them. So how do I change that model? I begin to understand them in great detail. So we have analytics profiling platforms for entity analytics. We have real-time platforms for feeding in all of that social data. And I can begin to create a 360-degree view of who that customer is, who that consumer is, how they consume, how they want to consume, what behaviors they exhibit, how do they respond to the kind of offers you give them. Then, importantly, I can understand what the network effects are. Who do they influence? Who do they relate to? What attributes in their model tie them to other sub-segments of the audience? And you get to pick, begin to present this very complex mosaic that shows how different attributes within your services are the things that actually resonate with certain sub-segments of your audience. So now if you're doing campaign marketing, you're doing targeting, you're new products and services, you're thinking about how you're going to change that user experience, now you have data to back it up on how you should target that. And then finally, with Watson, we're even doing psychological modeling now. We can take a small amount of human language written data that an individual has done, and we can begin to distill out of that what are their core psychological traits, and how do those traits actually drive their behaviors. This is the kind of analytics modeling that's, that's helping firms begin to understand their audience in much greater detail. And back to that point, if you know who those influencers are, you can activate those influencers and have them become your marketeers in order to drive your product or service. Because here's what's happened, back to the sports example. What happens in real time is consumers self-segment. This is a simple example around golf. Immersion, interactivity. If I, am, if I happen to be a very immersive, very interactive person, it's not hard at all with the emergence of VR to think I'll be standing in my house somewhere playing along with Jordan Spieth when he's hitting that shot. If I'm more analytics driven, I'll be diving into the analytics and statistics in real time to understand what's actually happening. In fact, we calculate the momentum of a match while it's happening against keys to the match. And we can publish that to second screen in real time. We can also give that same data back to the commentators so the narrative for the match actually changes based on what's actually happening from an analytics, from a deep analytics standpoint. If I want a more traditional experience, maybe I just want to be able to select what court I'm watching or what hole I'm watching in golf maybe what programming I'm watching, maybe what short-form content I want to watch in between some long-form content. And then if I'm more socially oriented, maybe it's not just about who's with me, but who's with me digitally, and how do I interact with them in a way that provides more value to me. The point is, if I'm building a media company today, I want to understand the journey that that customer is going to take with my business, my brand, my products, my services. And so we use that very large interactive agency I refer to to not only help design what the user interface needs to look like, but to help figure out how that user interface interacts with the, with the rest of the platform in order to constantly update and, and provide that kind of capability. And for me, the important part is we have to realize that consumers aren't just consuming. Think of yourself. They're publishing enormous amounts of information. I mean, one of the first use cases we saw was when user-generated content and video started finding its way into news workflows, right? So the idea that we can now read all this unstructured data, where it's human language, or it's audio, or it's image. One of the things we're doing with Watson in the, in the health field is Watson's looking at skin lesions now from an oncology standpoint. Millions and millions and millions of images from every corner of the globe. You walk into the doctor's office, he takes all your vital statistics, he looks at those images, and he can tell if the propensity of that to turn cancerous is higher or lower based on real factual information that's come from around the world. Information that no single doctor themselves would know. Now apply that to the media and entertainment world and think about video as a string of images that have been stitched together and our ability to go into those images and analyze all kinds of different information. So let me give you an example of a real use case that we're doing right now with the studios in Los Angeles. They've been predicting movies since they've been making movies. 
We all know they used to have a long time, windows and everything else to recoup their investment, 150 million to build it, 75 million to market it. Now, Thursday night, they release it. Everyone comes out of the theater texting. That movie could just be essentially over before it even starts, right? Huge risks, huge business risks. It affects all the downstream windows. It affects the entire business model of the studio. So what are we doing? We're taking all the old data that they've been using for years, focus groups, survey information, comparative analysis, genre mapping, all that data. But now we're adding in social data, other attributes from different data sets that we can collect, and integrating those data sets together. And then we're putting our predictive engines inside that so we can figure out the relationships between those different attributes and create a learning platform that week by week by week, as those movies get released, the platform gets smarter and smarter and smarter. But importantly, also, as that platform gets smarter and smarter and smarter, we back up from release window. Two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. Now you can start impacting the way you're marketing the film, the way your campaigns are executing, what subsegments of the audience you, you have the uh, ability to activate and which subsegments you probably don't. So you can start making business decisions that are grounded in a much more sophisticated analysis. And when we go back and we uh, essentially do benchmarks against what the studio performance and their predictions were, even at, at when the model is almost brand new, it does better. When the model's had a few weeks to start to train itself, it really gets better. So th this is the way that learning systems are beginning to impact operational decisions inside of media businesses. And the way I think about it is data moving to the center of the business model in the industry. So last point. So now we got data. We got interactive capability. We got cloud-based platforms that allow us to stitch together things that are happening inside our business. And, then, and by the way, IBM strategy is very clear. It's about hybrid cloud. We know things are going to execute for proximity or latency reasons inside a customer's business. Some of it's going to reside inside a cloud that we might provide, some of it a, a partner's cloud. But the design model needs to be able to orchestrate amongst those. So another couple of acquisitions we did, like Graviton or Blue Box, allows companies today to turn their entire internal business into a cloud and then extend that cloud with other providers' clouds like IBM's. <coughs> Why is it important? Because if you look at the disruptors in this industry, data sits at the center of their business model, every single one of them. So for the media industry, moving data to the center of the business model to me is the number one challenge facing the industry so that they can compete in, in, this, in this world. So Watson, why, why was Watson important? Well, it was nice that we won Jeopardy. What happened on Jeopardy, which was really interesting, is we had the, a really, really good use case. We had video on every game that had been ever played. So we could see how that game was performed, what worked, what didn't work. And we were going to play against the two best players that ever played, the one that won most games, the one that won most money. So that's all interesting. But what's really interesting, and Watson read, by the way, not connected to anything else, but at that time, way back in 2011, read 200 million pages in about two seconds' time, second and a half, in order to answer in context what the question was on the board. That was four years ago. But what was really important is when we started this challenge in 2007, when we started, started playing mock games against these players, we answered about 20% of the questions, and we got about 20% of them right, or Watson did. Their scatter diagram, you can see it, was somewhere in the 60 to 65% control of the board. They answered 60 to 65% of the questions in every game they played, and they were right 90% of the time. So if you're going to play them, you have to have a scatter diagram that's up in that range. The important thing that happened was in four years' time with our scientists, we improved the algorithm. So by the time we played in 2011, our scatter diagram was to up, up to the right of their scatter diagram. Now, we could have gotten a bad game and lost. We didn't. We won. But the point is, what happened between 2007 and 2011? Now, go back to that theatrical demand forecasting model that I just showed you. And think about a studio that's persisting data about how its movies are performing and getting deeper and deeper insight into how audiences are responding to their brands and products and services. And you start to see how this kind of capability, this cognitive capability integrated very seamlessly with the business is fundamentally going to change the business. So now we look at Watson. When we did Jeopardy, there was one API called Q&A. 
Under that API, there was five different uh, technologies that were invented in order to make it work. How to weigh evidence, how to score evidence, should I answer the question, should I not answer the question? What categories are it? What's the ontologies I need to measure that category? How to read all this human language at scale and speed? At the end of last year, there was 28 APIs. By the end of this year, there'll be 50 APIs. All of those are being made available through that Bluemix platform on software that can be integrated with any company's business model. Startups to the largest enterprise on the planet. And we're seeing startups already doing really amazing things where very quickly they can reach in and grab those APIs and essentially integrate cognitive capabilities into their applications. So here's just a list of the kinds of technologies that are now being built that allow you to create these learning platforms based on data sets that are coming from different parts of your business or partners in order to make your platform and your services more intelligent. So how's that impacting the industry? Back to this point about a, a next generation data model inside the media and entertainment industry, independent of segment, whether you're talking about television producers or studios or game platforms or information providers. It's about how do you take data from wherever it comes, from inside your business, from data sets you're buying, from the social world where you can read that all in real time now and integrate it, <clears throat> to partner data. And how do you integrate those data sets together so that you can interrogate them and you can extract insights out of them in the context of your business? So we're building these use cases around things like 360 degree targeting of an audience, churn prediction, marketing optimization, second screen enhancement, targeted advertising. These are the core propositions that drive the industry. And this is what I mean about having them now be informed by data in the workflow. So just to summarize, as I look at the industry and I think about what's gonna separate the winners from the losers going forward, I think there's five key design points to think about. You gotta design for constant change. In fact, you gotta design for accelerating change. So everything you do has to be open architecture. Everything you do has to be API driven. You have to be able to take advantage of the huge R&D investments that are being made by firms like IBM so that you leverage all that R&D into your business model and you can speed the time to market to put products and services in the marketplace. You gotta take advantage of this movement towards video-based services, cloud capability integrated with cognitive. Cloud is good. Cloud is great, you know, can be really effective, but a cloud that actually gives you insights into how people are consuming or improvements in the quality of experience that you're delivering or the ability to personalize that experience in real time at the moment that consumption is happening, now that's really powerful. And you gotta think about the skills that are at work inside the enterprise and the kind of skills that are necessary to take advantage of these technological changes. You gotta think much more horizontally. You know, how do you get marketplace agility? What is, how is it that all those consumers are interfacing with my brand across these channels? And how is it that all my products and services are being brought to market across those channels? And am I optimizing that? Am I doing things? So another example of a Watson technology is a federated search technology that can go out into all the content repositories in a media business and essentially begin to harmonize those, a federated search capability, because we all know in media companies, one thing can be called something over here and something else over here, but it could be the same thing or something that's related to each other. If you don't have intelligent search capability, you, you, you can't figure that out. So there, it's under exploitation of the assets that are already sitting inside the media enterprise. And then finally, it's this new battleground around audience insight and understanding how data is gonna be at the center of the business going forward. So just a couple charts quickly. At NEB, we're gonna be showing what I just talked about. In the South Hall, we're gonna have uh, our media enterprise framework solutions that we've been building with media companies for the last decade. In fact, we're working with media companies all over the globe to implement what I was just talking about. But we're also gonna have Aspera, Clearleap, Ustream, Cleversafe, all within one hallway. And begin to show how these cap capabilities are all integrating together to be able to provide the, the value that I was talking about. And as far as the kind of solutions we'll be showing, we'll be showing cognitive capabilities around how you do that data and analytics and create learning-based platforms. We'll be showing a whole bunch of solutions we've built around workflow optimization, network DVR I mentioned, flash capabilities. One of the things we're doing now with on the editing part of the business is using our flash technologies to dramatically improve the ability to get content to error by streamlining the editing platforms. And then these platform architectures. I think in terms of platforms now. So 
whether it's streaming live, whether it's video on demand, subscription video on demand. These are platform-based ar architectures that can scale instantly, globally, to reach consumers wherever they're at. So I hope that was helpful. That's what we're doing. That's where we're making our investments. We're working every single day with companies in the media and entertainment industry to help them take advantage of these innovations. And I think when you think about cloud, when you think about analytics and cognitive, when you think about video, you need to think about how they relate and how that comes together to provide that personalized, compelling experience for everyone who's interfacing with your brand. So thank you. I'll